In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and to the ages of all ages, Amen. To understand today's gospel, I'm going to need to, we're going to need to, to put ourselves a little bit in the disciples' shoes. Um, Jesus says to them, just before, just before he disappears into the Garden of Gethsemane to go and pray, he says, these few words to them. He says to them, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Up until that point, the disciples, if they wanted something from God, they would tell Jesus, ask your father to do this and that. And Jesus would pray and it would happen. So Jesus is telling them that soon, very soon, you won't ask me anymore, but you will ask the father directly. And whatever you ask the father, he will do for you. Why? You'll see. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. This is like the central verse of the whole passage that we're reading today. The Father loves you. Why? Because you have loved me and because you have believed in me. Look, there's a, this is like a really, 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 really important concept in Christianity, which I fear, forgive me having the, the great honor and privilege to listen to a lot of people and to listen to a lot of people coming for spiritual guidance, I feel most of us still have not grasped this. Most of us are still battling according to the law. Most of us are still seeing that there is, I mean, to be a good Christian, there's a set of things I should do and a set of things I shouldn't do, right? And I have to do one and two and three and four and five and six, and I have to not do seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12 and so on, right? This is the law. This is what was before Jesus. Jesus came to give us, to inaugurate for us and open the doors for us to live in the age of grace. The age over victory over all of these things. Yes, I try to live a true and honest Christian life as described by the list of one through, you know, 343 of the things I have to do and the list of one and to, 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 to six million things I should not do and so on. Yes, but that's not what makes, that's not what gives me favor with my Father in heaven. That's not what makes it so that every time I look up to my Father in heaven, he looks down and says, yes. That's not what makes it that my Father in heaven looks at me and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's not, it's not the list. What, what, what makes the Father in heaven and I have a deep relationship is because I love him and because he loves me and because I believe in him. So the battle in according to the law, was to try really hard to do the good and to try really hard not to do the bad. I'm not telling you that you ought not to try to live a moral life, but morality and true Christianity are worlds apart now, are worlds apart. Now, the struggle is to believe in Jesus, to believe in Jesus so much of, of, of our time is, is filled with discouragement. So much of our time is filled with sadness. So much of our time is filled with disbelief. You should have seen, you should have seen what it looked like when I was introducing the Pauline epistle. 
And I said, St. Paul is saying to you and to me, for those of you who are here, when I was introducing the Pauline epistle, St. Paul says, and your labor is not in vain. And I said, put your name there. John, your labor is not in vain. Mary, your labor is not in vain. Marie, your labor is not in vain. Put your name there. You should have seen the eyes of the whole congregation light up. We are constantly being assaulted with little voices, little voices whispering in our ear, everything you're doing is for nothing, doesn't matter, nothing you do works anyways, blah, blah, blah. All this little voices, little voices of discouragement in our ears. The battle now, forget the list for a moment, for a moment, forget the list of do this to be good, 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 don't do this or you'll be bad, don't do this or you'll be bad, don't do Forget the lists, forget the lists. Jesus has made it really simple. Why will the Father listen to, the pray to your prayers and he will do them? Because you believe in Jesus. Because when those little voices come, you ignore them. You do the sign of the cross and you say, I believe in Jesus. You say, I believe in God. You say, I believe that he has made my life have meaning. You say, I believe, like it says in scripture, your labor is not in vain. It's not in vain. And you stand to pray. And honestly, between you and me, you stand and you look up and you raise your hands and you put all your heart into it and you feel like you're talking to the ceiling. Do you believe? What do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe you're talking to the ceiling? Up to you. Are you talking to the ceiling? Or are you talking to him who is so far above and also so deep within? Those of you who, and myself, who sometimes feel like we're talking to the ceiling, try, 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 to, try to turn it on its head. God is, yes, in heaven, but God is also in my heart. Try to rest your chin on your chest and to direct your prayers inwards to the Lord, to the Lord who dwells in your heart. The battle is no longer to do this and not to do this, to do this and not. The battle is to believe, is to remain faithful, to remain believing when everything around you is telling you not to believe, when everything around you is telling you it's for nothing, when everything around you is telling you it doesn't matter, when everything around you is telling you nobody believes anymore. This is a lie. This is a lie. Look around you. Look around you right here, right now. I guarantee you, if you look around right now, I won't take offense if you lose eye contact with me and look around the room. I guarantee you, you'll be able to count at least 10 people that you don't know in this room that are here. Why are they here on a Sunday morning? Why are you here on a Sunday morning? They're probably here for the same reason as you are, right? But you don't know those 10 people. You didn't even know they existed. You don't know them from Adam, right? So is it possible that when that little voice comes to you and tells you, nobody believes in God anymore, you can answer it and say, every time I go to church, I see new faces. I see new people who overcome every obstacle to get themselves through the door, out of bed, in the shower, da da da, and get themselves to church on Sunday morning. Guess what? Guess what little voice talking to me? There must be people out there I've never even met who believe in Jesus just the same as I do. The struggle in this day and age is to believe, is to believe, is to remain faithful. Then comes the list. <gasps> but you did this, but you did that, but you did this. <gasps> Oh, and you did that one? Oh, only really terrible people do that one. Oh, but this, I believe in Jesus. I believe that what he says. I believe that he says, if I go to him, he will by no means cast me out. I believe that he loves me. I believe that, yes, today I fell. Tomorrow he will make me victorious. I believe in him. And St. John tells us, St. John tells us, that this believing, that this faith, that this faith is the victory which overcomes the world. This is the victory of the martyrs. The martyrs were standing there in front of the executioner 
with his sword full of blood from those who have come before, smiling and saying, you can't do anything to me. You can chop my head off for sure. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead. You'll send me to heaven. I've shared this story with you before, but I love it because it's so caricatural. St. Basil the Great was an archbishop of Caesarea, was preaching against the, the emperor because the emperor was doing all kinds of immoral things. So the emperor imprisoned him. So after he left him in prison for a few days, he brought him and he said, you have to stop speaking evil about me. And St. Basil said, do, do good and I, will, and, and I won't call you out on the evil that you're doing, right? But you're normalizing in the empire, you're normalizing wickedness. He says to him, how can you say that to the emperor? If you don't listen to me, I'll throw you in prison and leave you there for the rest of your days. He said to him, oh, what a relief. What a relief that you will take the burden of the, of the bishopric away from me and you will take the burden of all of all caring for all the churches and all the priests and all this and you will take that off my shoulders. I'll feel like I'm a monk again in my hermitage. I'll, I won't know how to thank you. He told, thank you. Have you, have you seen the dungeon? There's, no, there's, there's just like a, a cement block, nothing, no bed, nothing. He said, I'm, I'm a monk. I've slept on the floor my whole life. He said to him, I, I won't let you eat anything except vegetables. He says, I have not eaten anything except raw vegetables since I was ordained a monk. He said to him, I will kill you. He told him, yeah, thank you. You will send me to my beloved Savior, Jesus and remove from me the burden of this life. You see, the person, and the emperor didn't know what to do with him. He was victorious. He got sick of him and let him back to go back to his bishopric and continue to preaching, preaching against the deeds of the emperor. St. John tells us, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith, the fact that I trust what I believe in my heart more than I trust my own two eyes. My own two eyes are telling me disaster is certain. Your life is over. It's finished. But my heart is saying, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is the victory. This is the victory. Do you want to live in victory? Yes or no? Yes or no? Forget about the lists. Forget about your morality. Forget about trying to be a good Christian. I'm not telling you to be immoral. That's another story. The role of morality in Christianity, that's another story. Okay? But it's not the central point anymore. The central point is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Him? Do you believe that He died, that He rose from the dead, that he ascended to heaven, that he sent his Holy Spirit to come and live in the church, in you, in me, in my heart. This is the victory which overcomes the world. St. John tells us also in his epistle, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I have a question for you. What is your relationship to the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Are you aware of him? Have you, do you know his voice? Have you heard him speak to you? My answer to you, I won't give you a chance to answer. I will answer for you. The answer is yes. You have heard him speak. Every good thought, every good idea, every, every hope, every joy, every logical and useful thing you've come up with, I'm so sorry to break it to you, wasn't you. It was God inside of you. I know you think you're really smart. You are, and I love you very much. But there's one who's smarter than you, and he lives inside of you, and he's whispering to you, do this, don't do that, say this, don't say that. And he is, and he is guiding you. He is leading you. Know him. Learn to recognize his voice. Not so that you can have the greatest psychic in the universe dwelling inside of you, and you will have make all the best decisions, and live happily ever after on earth. No, that was never the point. Look at the, look at the pictures of the people on the walls. None of them lived happily ever after on earth, right? All of them lived holy on earth and happily ever after 
in the kingdom. Happy. They were happy on earth. They were happy because of their faith, not because of their circumstances. They were happy because of their faith, not because of their circumstances. God wants to give you and me the same power, the same power. Jesus is saying to you and he's saying to me today, today, all the Sundays of, of the resurrection, Jesus is saying, I am. Today, Jesus is saying, I am the one who overcomes the world. I am the victory. There's a beautiful saying in Latin, right? There's a beautiful, or Greek, Greek, Isos Christos Nika. You know Nike, the, the brand of shoes? Where did they get their name? Nika, N-I-K-A, like alpha in, in Greek. Victor, victor. He is the victor. He is the victorious one. He is the one who stared death in the face and said, I surrender to the will of my father. He is life itself. He is life itself, and he accepted to die. I mean, nobody knew what would happen if life dies. In the book of Job, let me try to help you understand existentially what this means. Like, this is, this is the burden of Christ in Gethsemane. We think Jesus was, like, afraid, you know, to, to break his nails on the cross, you know. Jesus was afraid to lose his perm, you know, on the cross, right? Jesus was afraid to suffer. No. No. It was far more primordial than that. Jesus is life. In the book of Job, it says that he upholds all things, and without his breath, all things would cease to exist. Jesus is like Jesus, the Spirit of God, specifically the Spirit of Christ, the life giver, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ who dwells in him and dwells in the Holy Trinity, is the life of the world. Nobody knew what will happen if he dies. If life dies, what will happen? Will the world cease to exist? You know, like, the, the, the people who study like the Big Bang and all of that and stuff. Very interesting stuff. And they say that like, like everything happened so perfectly at the perfect density. At the perfect density. And that if things were, I can't remember one billionth, don't quote me because I didn't read it in preparation for today, but I've read it multiple times before, right? If things were one billionth more dense, the world would have imploded upon itself. And if there was one billionth less, less dense, the world would have continued to disperse. It wouldn't have had the density to hold itself together, and it would have just, the universe, what little had come to exist, would have just dispersed and fallen all apart. That's what he, he's saying in Job 36. He's saying that he upholds all things. What happens if life dies? Jesus said, I believe. I believe you, Father. Jesus says, this is completely against all of me. I am life. How can I die? But Father, as you will, not as I will. Can we do the same? Can we do the same? Can we say with Jesus, I believe? Jesus says, yes, you can. And that's why the Father loves you. And that's why the Father loves you. I tell you the truth. I spent an half an hour praying this morning about whether I should tell you all this or not. But I'm going to tell you. I don't want to discourage you. I know a handful of people. They were five. One of them went to heaven. I know four people. These people, if they ask God for anything, I want to tell you, it seems like anything they ask him, he does. Anything he, they ask him, he does. These people, each one of them has suffered so, so, so much in their own way. And they continue to believe in him. I tell you, when they, when they talk to me, so one of them is one of my spiritual children, which is so ironic, but that's its own story, right? And when, when this person speaks to me in spiritual guidance, I think to myself, I think to myself, I'm jealous. God, I want you to love me like you love this person. And I feel like Jesus just tells me, believe in me. 
believe in me. These people would walk off a bridge if God told them. They would walk right off the CN Tower if God told them. They believe in him. They believe in him. They don't believe in what he can do. If he tells me to do walk off the CN Tower, that means he's going to catch me. No, I might crash to my death. But maybe that's what he wants. If that's what he wants, that's what I'll do. I just need to do what he says. I tell you the truth. There is a much deeper, much greater blessing than the life that we are living in now. And it's not complicated. It's not complicated. It's just about believing in him. It's about believing in him and having intimacy with him. And then we experience that, yes, indeed, he has overcome the world. And then, yes, indeed, we end up with a little smile on our face that nobody can wipe off. Be of good cheer, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. What has overcome the world? Your faith. Your believing in him. I'm going to read it to you one last time when he says to his disciples, Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came forth from God. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. I have sinned. Forgive me, my fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters.